series is called The Gap Between Law and Practice. And uh, if you follow English law, you can see it wasn't respected. The Supreme Court in Australia considered this issue in a case called Mabo. And here's what they had to say. The idea that land, which is in regular occupation, may be terra nullius, or an empty land, is unacceptable in law as well as in fact. As the basis of the theory is false in fact and unacceptable in our society, there is a choice of legal principles to be made. And I think that this, this choice is being squarely placed before the, the courts in Canada. It was squarely placed in front of the Court of Appeal in British Columbia in the, uh, in the Chilcotin case, which I understand is now going to be going to the Supreme Court of Canada. So there's going to be a choice again that's going to be faced, placed squarely in front of the court. Now, whether the indigenous peoples in Australia are going to have any greater success is, is still a question. You know, whether they're actually going to have their land rights recognized and whether the government is actually going to implement a process to recognize those land rights, I think is still a question. But at least the court made some pretty clear statements in terms of this underlying thesis or this underlying um, doctrine that somehow by merely discovering a country gave those inhabitants superior rights than the original inhabitants. In terms of, of the, uh, the declaration, the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, as we know, Canada opposed that declaration for, for uh, some years. And so again, we see some statements being made by the government of Canada that there's this need to balance um, between the rights of indigenous peoples and others. So if we look at um, the indigenous human rights approach, and um, our, as Grace said, our group has been involved in, in bringing Canada before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, um, which has led us to have the opportunity to get involved and to, uh, to uh, study and to learn um, as much as we can about the human rights approach. So let's look at a few of the decisions that have come forward from this human rights approach. The human rights system for the Americas internationally is uh, under the umbrella of what is referred to as the Organization of American States. Their membership consists of all of the countries in North America, Central America, South America, with the exception of Cuba. They have two organizations that really deal with human rights in America, in the Americas. The Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and the Inter-American Court on Human Rights. So we're going to look at a few of the cases. The first one is the Agostini versus Nicaragua. So the Agostini people brought a case before the Inter-American Commission. I think it was one of the first cases. And it went before the Inter-American Court. A much different approach than we see under domestic law a much different approach than we saw coming out of the British Columbia Court of Appeal in the Chilcotin decision. The Inter-American Court says that Nicaragua had an obligation to protect the Nicaraguan people's lands from being exploited. They had an obligation to title their lands, to demarcate and title their traditional lands. And, um, and it took several years, but the Nicaraguan government has in fact demarcated entitled lands to the Nicaraguan people. The Dan Sisters versus the United States. This is the decision of the Inter-American Commission. So the Dan Sisters were from the Western Shoshone Nation. They had some horses uh, on traditional lands. Those horses were confiscated by the United States government and they eventually ended up before the Inter-American Commission. And this is what the Inter-American Commission had to say. 
where property and user rights of indigenous peoples arise from rights existing prior to the creation of a state. Indigenous peoples have the right to recognition by that state of the permanent and inalienable title of indigenous peoples relative thereto, and to have such title changed only by mutual consent between the state and respective indigenous peoples where they have full knowledge and appreciation of, for, of the nature or attributes of such property. This also implies the right to fair compensation in the event that such property and user rights are irrevocably lost. The Maya people brought a case uh, against Belize. Accompanying the existence of the Maya people's community right to property under Article 26, and this is Article 26 of the Declaration, the American Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Man. So American meaning North, Central, and South America, not the United States. So there's this Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Man. Article 23 it talks about right to property. In the Commission's view, this necessarily includes engaging in effective and informed consultations with the Maya people concerning the boundaries of their territory and that the traditional land use practices and customary land tenure system can be taken into account in this process. Again, a much different dialogue, a much different way of, of relating to the rights of indigenous peoples. The Suramaki people brought a case uh, against Suriname. In any case, the right of the members of the Suramaki people in particular, or members of indigenous and tribal communities in general, to collectively own their territory has not, as of yet, been recognized by any domestic court in Suriname. And we could say the same thing of Canada, exactly the same thing. The Soho Maxa indigenous community versus Paraguay. So remember back to what the courts in Canada said, that First Nations just have a right to the use of the land. They don't have ownership rights to the land. Well, they say different here. They say that indigenous people's title should be an equivalent to full property title that's recognized by the state. The members of indigenous peoples who have unwillingly left their traditional lands or lost possession thereto maintain property rights thereto even though they lack legal, legal title unless the lands have been lawfully transferred to third parties in good faith and the members of the indigenous peoples who have unwillingly lost possession of their lands when those lands have been lawfully transferred to innocent third parties are entitled to restitution thereof or to obtain other lands of equal extension and quality. Consequently, possession is not a requisite conditioning the existence of indigenous land restitution rights. So this is kind of what our case is about. In our territory, the government of Canada and the government of British Columbia granted away our entire territory to a private corporation. And, and then we get to the treaty table 100 years later and they say, well, those lands are held by private third parties, and those lands are not on the table for negotiation. And by the way, we're not talking about compensation for past wrongs. So, you know, it goes directly against what the court here is saying, is that when a state confiscates a people's land, they have an obligation to either return it or to compensate for it. So here's uh, our group, Halkomenum Treaty Group versus Canada. Again, the unequivocal position was that private land's not on the table in the treaty process, and uh, they're not prepared to compensate. What did the commission say? By failing to resolve the Halkomenum claims with regard to their ancestral lands, the British Columbia treaty process has demonstrated that it is not an effective mechanism to protect the right. Indeed, examining the government's position that if a First Nation does not wish to accept its terms, negotiating, it can litigate. The commission noted that there is no due process of law to protect the property rights of the Halkomenum to its ancestral lands. Now that's a pretty powerful statement. To say that there is no due process of law. 
that will protect our property rights is a very significant statement. They go on to say, the legal proceedings mentioned, that is, Canada had argued, well, look at all these court cases that the First Nations are winning. They say, the legal proceedings, the legal cases mentioned, do not seem to provide any reasonable expectation of success because Canada's jurisprudence has not obligated to set the state to set boundaries, to demarcate and to record title deeds to lands of indigenous peoples. And therefore, in the case of the Hulkaminum, those remedies would not be effective under recognized general principles of international law. Again, a pretty heavy condemnation. What we argued is there has been no court in Canada that has ever recognized and made a declaration that the state had an obligation to demarcate and title lands right up to Chilcotin, right up to 2012. We'll see what the Supreme Court of Canada does, whether they change um, the, the direction. The United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination made this comment. In many regions of the world, indigenous peoples have been and are still being discriminated against and deprived of their human rights and fundamental freedoms. They have lost their land and resources to colonialists, commercial companies, and state enterprises. Consequently, the preservation of their culture and their historic identity has been and is still jeopardized. In our case, we had evidence that went before uh, the Inter-American Commission about the effect that that transaction that happened 100 years ago continues to have on our community today. You have logging companies now that have bought these lands in private ownership. They put up gates, they put up fences. They say that you're not permitted to go onto their lands. So these are the kind of things that are happening. Um, ancient uh, burial sites are being impacted. Um, and with impunity, the UN Human Rights Committee made this statement. It says the Human Rights Committee recommended that Canada reform its laws and internal policies to guarantee the full enjoyment of rights over land and resources for the indigenous peoples of Canada. Additionally, the committee recommends that Canada abandon the practice of extinguishing inherent Aboriginal rights as incompatible with Article I of the Covenant. The UN Committee on the, on the Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights made this statement. The committee, while noting that the state party has withdrawn since 1998, the requirement of an express reference to extinguishment of Aboriginal rights, and they're talking about Canada here, and titles, even in a comprehensive, either in a comprehensive claims agreement or in the settlement legislation ratifying the agreement, remains concerned that the new approaches, namely the modified rights model and the non-assertion model, do not differ much from the extinguishment and surrender approach. I'm part of the negotiations right now. We're meeting with the government of Canada and the government of British Columbia at a table that has 60 some nations that are part of it, the common table. I'm one of the spokespersons. We're talking about this issue today. Today we're talking about this issue, whether it's extinguishment or whether it's modification or whether it's non-assertion. But at the end of the day, Canada says what we want from you is we want to guarantee that you will never exercise your rights again into the future. Doesn't matter what we call it, but that's what we want. So, you know, this policy continues to today. In the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, Article 27 makes this statement. States shall establish and implement in conjunction with Indigenous peoples concerned a fair, independent, impartial, open, and transparent process giving due recognition to Indigenous peoples' laws, traditions, customs, and land tenure systems to recognize and adjudicate the rights of Indigenous peoples pertaining to their lands, territories, and resources including those that were traditionally owned or otherwise occupied or used. Indigenous people shall have the right to participate in this process. Indigen Article 28, Indigenous peoples have the right to redress by means that can include restitution or where this is not possible of a just, fair, and equitable compensation for the lands, territories, and resources which they have traditionally owned or otherwise occupied or used or which have been confiscated, taken, occupied, used, or damaged 
without their free prior and informed consent. And this is again the situation that we're in. When we're at the negotiating table with Canada, what we're told is basically, this is our position. You can either take it or you can leave. And in fact, that's what the chief negotiator for Canada said to one of our chiefs. If you don't like our position, you can leave. So, you know, this fair, impartial process doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. <clears throat> the UN Special Rapporteur, <clears throat> Jim Anaya, made this statement. He said, accordingly, the declaration does not attempt to bestow Indigenous peoples with a set of special or new human rights, but rather provides a contextualized elaboration of general human rights principles. Uh, and rights as they relate to the specific historical, cultural, and social circumstances of Indigenous peoples. From this perspective, the standards of the Declaration connect the existing state obligations under other human rights instruments. And in our case, this is Canada's argument. Well, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is an aspirational document. It doesn't, doesn't bind us to anything. We don't have to follow it. And so, you know, they, they have been very much arguing that they do not have to follow these human rights principles, that they're not something that the government has to comply with. Under the human rights system, we have the United Nations, which looks at general human rights, which includes the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and then under the Organization of American States, you have the Organization of American States Charter and the American Declaration on the Rights and Duties of Man. So under both systems, there are provisions with respect to indigenous people's rights. There's these two types. One is the hard law, which is binding on states, treaties, conventions, covenants, and um, countries must take a positive step. They have to sign on to it. In fact, they have signed on to the Organization of American States Charter. So that should be hard law, but yet they, they choose to say that it's not. And then there's soft law. General Assembly resolutions, declarations, reports, and so forth. And this is kind of where Canada puts the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The message is that somehow we have to move the government of Canada to that point where they do recognize that they have these international obligations and they actually begin to recognize human rights. And you know, for a country that says for so many years that they were advocates of human rights, where Canada once was a peacekeeping nation, Canada now sends you know, armed military into countries. So I think as Canadian citizens, you need to weigh in on this issue. You know, should Canada respect human rights? Should Canada, um, you know, begin to move back to that kind of a, a political stance? And if that's what you believe, then, you know, I would encourage you to voice your opinions. You know, the, the ability of the government to infringe on the human rights of indigenous peoples with impunity without any consequence, must send you know, a signal that if they can do that to indigenous peoples, then certainly they can do that to other peoples. So, you know, again, I um, want to thank you for, for listening. So we have a big round of applause. Canada has been a lead on this, and Gail Davidson at the far corner has done a lot of the groundwork and logistics. So I want a round of applause for Gail, please. And we do, of course, want to let you know that we are doing this as a monthly series, and so the next one will be uh, Thursday, February 28th, uh, Indigenous Law as a Solution to Resource Conflict in Treaty 8, and we'll feature uh, Khalid Ben. He's a Icho Dene and Duneza Cree from the Treaty 8 territory of northeastern BC. And he'll be dealing with the whole issue of hydraulic fracturing.